Society was changing at a rapid rate, and voters made it known that they wanted a slower pace. Little did they know the government would come to a complete halt during the 1920s. Three presidents came to power and all subscribed to laissez-faire, or hands-off policies, when addressing big business. It was thought that leaving business alone created prosperity. Republican Warren G. Harding ushered in the decade becoming president in 1920. People ask whether or not Harding is a good president or a bad president, and I think that's almost the wrong question. Not almost, I think it is the wrong question. There are, in the course of American history, great presidents, mediocre presidents, bad presidents. Harding's not even in the running. Known as the best of the second raiders, Harding was one of the most corrupt presidents. His card-playing friends, referred to as the poker cabinet, often used their friendship with the president to fill their pockets with taxpayers' money. He, he puts in charge of the VA a guy he met um, on a trip to Hawaii, and he liked the guy, so he said, what would you like to do? And the VA is booming. I mean, this is right after the First World War. And he'll take the VA. You got it. No big deal. Turns out the guy's a former army deserter, but you know, what the hell? The biggest controversy to come out of the Harding administration was the Teapot Dome scandal, where Secretary of Interior Albert Fall leased government oil fields to wealthy friends. This branded Fall with the distinction of being the first cabinet member in history to go to prison for committing a felony. President Harding died in office on August 2, 1923, and was succeeded by his vice president, Calvin Coolidge. Silent Cal was old-fashioned in his virtues, stayed away from scandal, and rarely spoke. A dinner guest once confronted the president and said, Mr. Coolidge, I've made a rather sizable bet with my friends that I can get you to say three words this evening. The president replied, you lose. Coolidge often stated that the business of America is business and did everything he could to champion the cause. He kept tariffs high and taxes low. The thriving economy distracted the public from Coolidge's lack of imagination, leadership skills, and compassion for suffering farmers. The ineffective Coolidge opted not to run in 1928, offering no reason for his decision. Humorist Will Rogers jibed, the president retired from office a hero, not only because he hadn't done anything, but because he had done it better than anyone else. For most Americans, a two-bit president was fine as long as the economy stayed strong. During Coolidge's reign, industrial production, corporate profits, and personal income rose to record levels. A new middle class arose from the influx of white-collar job openings. More women were working outside of the home during the 20s. They often held low-paying jobs as typists, office workers, and telephone operators. Sex discrimination kept many women from advancement and promotion. Author Sinclair Lewis wrote, women were expected to keep clean and be quick moving. Beyond that, they were as unimportant to the larger phases of office politics as frogs to a summer hotel. Corporations were experiencing massive growth generated by efficient management, increased productivity, and new technologies people started investing in the booming stock market for the first time. By mid-decade, more than a million and a half Americans owned active stock market accounts. A happier workforce and increased wages led to a new era in consumerism. Electricity was becoming prevalent in urban households. With new convenience came must-have items like refrigerators, toasters, irons, vacuum cleaners, and washing machines. Advances in mass production drove down manufacturing costs, which in turn made products cheaper. A Model T car cost $850 in 1908, and by 1927, only set a family back $290. Installment plans were created to make buying high-priced items more affordable. Instead of shelling out $100 for a new washing machine, consumers would put $5 down and pay $8 a month. The dangers of debt and high interest rates didn't enter the minds of most Americans, and shopping raged throughout the decade. Advertising became part of the fabric of American culture as ads dominated newspapers and magazines. Sex appeal, social snobbery, 
outrageous claims, and fabricated scientific studies convince consumers to buy more. And Listerine ads would make it absolutely clear, and I'm not trying to pick on them because say, I can do this for shirts, I can do this for just a variety of products, that if you don't buy this product, you, you are, everybody's going to just shun you. I, I mean, you're just going to be a pariah. So there was this incredible catalog of things you now had to buy if you wanted to be middle class. Retail stores began to sprout up with increasing demand for products. Standard Oil went from 12 gas stations in 1920 to over 1,000 by 1929. The A&P grocery store chain boasted over 15,000 stores nationwide by decade's end. Sears and Roebuck, J.C. Penney, Woolworth, and many other retailers provided over 160,000 chain stores by the late 20s. Quality of life was on the upswing in America. With such a healthy economy, it was no surprise when the American people elected Republican Herbert Hoover to the presidency in 1928. An American success story, Herbert Hoover was born to an Iowa farmer and orphaned at age 10. He earned a degree from Stanford, became a mining engineer, and was a self-made millionaire by 40. As Secretary of Commerce under the previous two presidents, Hoover supported better nutrition for children, eight-hour workdays, and helped create the Pollution Act of 1924, the first attempt to control coastline oil pollution. Like his two predecessors, Hoover dedicated his administration to promoting business interests while, for the most part, ignoring the desperate state of America's heartland. With the war's closure, 